Is there a green light on? Nope. Uh, hold it down for maybe. Oh, I didn't hold it down yeah. long enough. Okay. I'm challenged in several ways. I'm follically challenged, vertically challenged, and electronically challenged. I'll start up this. And also memory challenged. <laughs> now open your Bibles, please. The Acts chapter 8. We're going to spend the entire lesson studying in Acts chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 5 of Acts chapter 8 and read down through verse 24. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 24. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirit, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he astonished them with the sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ, both the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God that perhaps the fault of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of the things that you have spoken may come upon me. That's the reading of Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 24. And that will be the subject matter for the entirety of our study this evening. You know, when I was in high school, that was a long, long time ago, I took uh, Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. I never did like Algebra. I struggled with Algebra. I blame it all on the teacher, of course. But nonetheless, it simply was not my forte. But I did find out, not because I did want to pass, or to plan to go to college and make a school teacher, which I did. But nonetheless, I wanted to pass algebra. So I discovered that at the back of the book, there were some sample problems. And if I didn't understand the principle that that teacher was trying to get through my thick skull, and I didn't understand what was in the book, I could turn to the back of the book and could see those principles worked out in sample problems. And that simplified it so I could get the point of what the book was trying to get across and what the teacher was trying to get through my school. The sample problems make things simpler to understand. There are books in the Bible that have the principles of salvation. The whole plan of salvation is covered in the book of Romans. But it's a deep book. It's difficult to understand. Uh, and, and any preacher that tells you otherwise, I, well, he's either a whole lot smarter than I am or he thinks he knows more than he knows. But nonetheless, the book of Romans is a difficult book. And it contains all the principles we need to know in order to be saved. 
But if you have a hard time understanding the principles that are taught in the book of Romans and the other books of the Bible that uh, teach us the principles of salvation and how to live for the Lord, then you can turn to the book that has the samples worked out for us and see those principles exemplified. That's the book of Acts. The book of Acts contains the story of the first century church from the time that Jesus ascended back on high until the Apostle Paul had been in prison for two years in Rome, which covers a period of about 30 years. And so during that time, the church began and grew, and the gospel spread to the world. And that book of, of Acts contains the examples that show us the principles, that exemplify for us the principles that are found in the meteor books of the New Testament. So if you want to know how to be saved, the best place to go is that the principles are all worked out for you in Romans. And you can go through the book, and I have a sermon I love to preach called The Roman Road to Salvation. You may have heard that ser sermon preached a lot of times. And, and in the book of Romans, all you need to know to be saved is found there. But sometimes it's difficult to understand, so you can turn to the book of Acts, and you can see the sample problem. There's a problem that a lot of people have trouble with. And that problem is sin in the life of the Christian. Most people admit that Christians struggle with sin. And that we, none of us lives a life without sin. We have to depend upon the grace of God for our salvation. But there's all kinds of theories that people have worked out in their own minds that simply contradict what the scripture said to get around the problem that we have in our lives as Christians with sin. Well, we have an example. We have more than one, but one particular one we're going to look at this evening. Uh, an example of sin in the life of a disciple of Christ. Now, this is before the name Christian had been given to the disciples. That was in Acts 11, 25, and 26, and we're going to be studying in Acts chapter 8. So the name Christian had not yet been given. But we're going to talk about a disciple of Christ who fell away and, and he, he lost his salvation. We're going to prove it as we go through this. And though he was a saved, born again, disciple of Christ, child of God, yet he sinned, he fell, he was lost. And what could he do in order to be saved? All of that is covered. Now some people deny that that's possible to happen. And this example shows not only is it possible, but it did happen. And so we want to look at the example of Simon to clarify this problem, not just of sin, but of just one little sin. Christians struggle with that problem. You mean, preacher, that just one little sin in my life? If I don't repent of it, confess it, and pray God for forgiveness, just one little sin will cause me to be lost? Well, I'm not going to answer that question. We're going to let the inspired writer Luke answer that question as we get, as we study this example of the case of Simon the sorcerer, who had been a magician, who became a disciple of Christ, and then fell from grace. Will one, just one little sin cause a child of God to be lost? Well, let's study the case of Simon. First of all, we need to prove conclusively, some people deny this. We need, in fact, our, our, our friends out in the denominational world who teach once saved, always saved, they deny that Simon was ever saved to begin with. But I believe it's exceedingly simple and easy to prove that Simon became a saved man. If you read in Acts chapter 8, uh, verses uh, 12 and 13, Simon, be Simon believed and obeyed just as the other Samaritans did. Look at Acts chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, everybody admits, anyone I've ever talked to, uh, last year, a year ago, we were having a study in the local library in Mountain Home, Arkansas, uh, on the book of Acts, and there was a lady in that study now, that believe once saved, always saved. And by the way, when we got to Acts chapter 8, she got mad and left and never came back. But nonetheless, she accepted the fact that Simon was, well, no, excuse me, she denied that Simon was a saved man. She accepted the fact 
that the other Samaritans were saved, but she denied that Simon was saved, even though they did exactly the same thing as far as becoming a, a disciples of Christ. When they believed that preach Philip as he preached things concerning the name of God, the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. The Samaritans believed and were baptized. Were they saved? Well, notice what Jesus said we need to do to be saved. And Mark 16, verse 16, when he gave the Great Commission, Mark's record of the Great Commission, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. The Samaritans believed, they were baptized. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, if you believe what Jesus said, then you know that the Samaritans were saved people. But notice, please, that Simon did the same thing exactly that the other Samaritans did. Then Simon himself also believed. I want you to notice, it even mentioned emphatic concerning Simon. Simon himself also, that makes it emphatic, Simon believed. And when he was baptized, Simon believed and was baptized just as the other Samaritans believed and were baptized. Why would anybody accept that the Samaritans were saved because they believed and baptized, but denied that Simon was saved when he believed and baptized just as, and was baptized just as the other Samaritans were. All of them had done what Jesus said to do in order to be saved in Mark 16, 16. He even believed and is baptized shall be saved. And so they were all saved. The Samaritans and Simon were all saved at this point. So Simon at this point is a saved man. He's born again. He's bought with the blood of Christ. He's a child of God. He's a disciple of Christ. Whatever can be said about the other Samaritans can be said about Simon. But I want you to notice, there's more said about Simon's salvation than is said about the other Samaritans. Because it says he continued with Philip. In Acts chapter 8, verse 13, then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now that one word continue in Acts chapter 8 verse 13 is a translation of the same Greek word which is written by two words in Acts chapter 2 verse 42. When it's talking about the, the, the first disciples there in Jerusalem, it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Really, they were doing the same thing that Simon did. They continued steadfastly in following the teaching of the apostles. Simon continued, and that word continued, is from the same word in the original that's translated by the two words, continued steadfastly in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So it could be written correctly, Simon continued steadfastly with Philip. And so, and of course, Philip was the inspired preacher of the gospel. He was a prophet. Uh, he was an evangelist, inspired of God. And so when he was following the teaching steadfastly of uh, Philip, he was doing the same thing the disciples in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 were doing. That's a statement of their faithfulness, and that's a statement of Simon's faithfulness. At this point, Simon is a saved, born again, bought with the blood of Christ, child of God. He's faithful to the Lord. There's nothing in the passage that would lead anybody to think otherwise unless they have a theory that they're trying to uphold, and that's the problem. Some have a, a theory that they're trying to uphold. But Simon had a problem. Simon sinned. In Acts chapter 8, begin reading in verse 14. Now when the apostles were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them, and had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and, the Holy, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone whom I lay hands in receive the Holy Spirit. So Simon wanted to have the same power that the apostles had. 
to lay his hands on people and impart the miraculous reception of the Holy Spirit to them. And when Simon tried to do that, when he tried to buy the miraculous power to impart the Holy Spirit, then Simon fell from grace. Simon sinned and fell. And you can't you can argue all you want to about the possibility of apostasy. Simon did. He was a saved, born again. I know I'm repeating myself. I'm trying to emphasize this. He was a saved, born again, child of God, a disciple of Christ. He sinned and he fell. But you don't have to argue about the fact that you fell. In fact, there's no way that anybody can doubt that. Because you read Acts chapter 8, verses 20 through 23, and it emphatically shows that Simon fell. Peter said to him, your money perish with you. Simon was in danger of perishing. And I don't believe he's talking about it physically. He's talking about it spiritually. Because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion of this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God, Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I perceive that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Now, I like the old King James Version there. And by the way, I notice that some of the, the newer translations, the, the New American Standard, the English Standard, render it the same way as the old English or the, the old King James Version, where it says, not that you're poisoned by bitterness, but that you're in... The gall of bitterness. And that's the literal translation. The gall of bitterness. He was and is bitter. You know, gall is as bitter substance as there is. And if you're in the gall of bitterness, you are in as bitter a spiritual condition as you can possibly get into. And he says, you are bound by iniquity. You have become the slave of sin. Simon, who had been and was, a born-again, bought with the blood of Christ, saved child of God. Simon sinned. And now at this point in the lesson, Simon is in as bitter a spiritual condition as he can get himself into, and he is the slave of sin. Now that's the description of a man who is lost. He was saved, he sinned, now he's lost. Don't tell me that a child of God cannot so sin as to be found a lost Simon sin, he fell, he was lost. He fell from grace. Don't tell me that a child of God can't fall from grace. Simon fell from grace. But there's more to the story. And so let's get the rest of the story. Now to this point, probably if you're a member of the Church of Christ, you agree with everything that I've said. But now let's get deeper into the story. As Paul Harvey would say, let's hear the rest of the story. There's more to this than people immediately think about. You see, Simon had, I believe, every excuse that I've ever heard anyone give for a child of God's sin. And they'll give these excuses and say, surely, God doesn't count that sin against him. Surely, that sin. And then they'll give some way they think it's automatically taken care of. Like, continuous cleansing, or like uh, uh, the, the life of Christ being imputed to the child of God, some mechanism not taught in the Scriptures, whereby one little sin, just one little sin is taken care of automatically without the sinner repenting, confessing, and asking God for forgiveness. Simon had every excuse I've ever heard anybody give that God would simply overlook the sin. That he committed. First of all, Simon was a babe in Christ. In, in Acts chapter 8, verses 13 to 14, then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when, now notice, it's not sometime after, it's when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Now, Samaria is a two-day journey by foot from Jerusalem, down from Jerusalem. And so it could have been in as little as four days that the news from the time that Simon believed and became a child of God, that news came from Samaria up to Jerusalem, that the Samaritans received the word of God 
and the apostles decided to send out Peter and John to make the two day journey down to Samaria so they could receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it may have been longer than that. It, it may have been as much as, uh, let's say, 40 days. What well, do you ask you? A person, man or woman, has been a child of God for 40 days. Is that still a baby in Christ? That's still a baby in Christ, isn't it? So Simon was a babe in Christ. And did God overlook his sin because he was just a babe in Christ and didn't know any better? Let me ask you a question. Little babies are ignorant of a lot of things that have to do with their safety, aren't they? Does that protect them from being harmed because they're ignorant of those things? They're just little babies. You know, little babies are attracted to things that move and things that are bright. And what moves and is bright more than an open flame? And so you have, a, say you have a, a gas stove in your house. And it's, you have an open flame there. And little baby is close to that. What's that little baby want to do? They want to reach out their baby hands and grab that flame. They don't know that it burns. They don't know that it will severely burn them. They're ignorant of that. Does that keep the little baby from being burned? No. That's the reason we have to be careful and take care of little babies, to make sure that doesn't happen, to protect them from harm. And by the way, that's the reason. If you have newborn children of God in the congregation, you need to protect them, lift them up, and teach them. You don't stop teaching when they're baptized. That's just the beginning of the teaching process. You have to build them up in the most holy faith so they can be protected and learn what from No, because he was a babe in Christ. Still, Peter said, you in the God of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He was lost, even though he just sinned one time as a babe. And by the way, before he sinned, he was walking in the light. He says he, he was amazed. He continued with Philip and was made seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Continued. Remember, that's continued steadfastly, or literally. He was continued steadfastly following the teaching and the example of the inspired evangelist Philip. So he was walking in the light. I have preachers, I've had preachers argue with me. Oh, surely someone who's walking in the light and just sins one time. God's not going to hold that against them, but the blood of Christ will automatically and continuously cleanse them. And they've even compared that like a windshield wiper on your car. It won't keep the raindrops from hitting your windshield, but just as soon as the raindrop hits, it'll wipe it off. Now, that's automatic forgiveness. Isn't it? I don't have, once I turn those windshield wipers on, I don't have to do a thing to keep them going. They'll keep going until I turn them off. And that's the concept, that's automatic forgiveness. And that's the concept that a number of our brethren have when the teaching of the continuous cleansing of the blood of Christ. Peter didn't know that, of that child of God who was walking in the light and sinned one time, he said, you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. No, don't believe the doctrine of continuous cleansing. It's not so, it's simply made up as an excuse to get around repenting of our sins. And there's another thing. He fell through human weakness. Let me ask you something. Well, we'll turn over first of all and prove this, then I'll make my point. Acts 8, verses 18 and 19. When Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, then you will whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. How had Simon made his living before he became a disciple of Christ? He was a magician. And he had used magical tricks. And by the way, there was a magician's guild. And you know what they did? Those fellows who were in that magician's guild, it would be like a trade union today, they would buy and sell the knowledge of the tricks they did to amaze people to think they had magical powers. And so that's what he had done. That, he was going back to his old way of life. That's what he was doing. He had escaped that, and now he's, as Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 2, he's like the hog returning his wallow in the mire, or the dog returning his own vomit. He's returning his own way of life. That's the way he'd always done. 
There's an amazing trick, and I don't know how to do that. Here, I'll give you some money to buy the knowledge of how to do that trick. He was lowering the power, the miraculous divine power of the Holy Spirit. He was lowering it to the level of black magic, which he had been doing for years. And thus, he did that in ignorance. He didn't know any better. And he did it through human weakness. He was reverting to his old way of life. Now, let me ask you something. Did you ever know of anybody to sin through strength? You don't sin through strength, do you? You know what the devil does? The devil finds your weaknesses. He doesn't work on your strength. He knows you're strong there. The old devil finds where you're weak. And that's what he works on. And if you have that weakness and he works on it and you sin, then you've fallen. And you need to repent of that sin and ask God for forgiveness. But I'm getting ahead of myself. And so, it, so is your weakness. You need to learn to get strong in that area. And if you sin through that weakness that you have, then you need to overcome that, get stronger there, uh, and so you can overcome that. But God does not look at because you sin through weakness. That's how people do sin, is through, unless it's through rebelliousness. And, and that's another lesson entirely. Simon was ignorant. He sinned one time, and he did it through ignorance. How do you know it was ignorance, preacher? Well, look at Acts chapter 8, verse 20. But Peter said to him, Your money perish, perish with you because, now notice carefully, you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. He really thought he could buy the apostolic powers and part of the spiritual gift with money. Now, can you buy the power of God with money? Can you buy blessings from God with money? You can't do that. God doesn't sell His blessings. Silver and gold won't give you salvation, and silver and gold won't give you blessings from God. He thought He could do that. He sinned through ignorance. Does God overlook sins and ignorance? We have the obligation to learn God's will. He doesn't overlook sins and ignorance. Let me give you an illustration of this. Suppose you're driving down Highway 50, and, and you, you've been overseas for the last however many years, and you didn't know that uh, several years ago the speed limit was, what, 55 miles an hour on open highway on Highway 50 now? And you didn't know it had been lowered to 55 miles an hour. You thought the speed limit was 70. In fact, let me put this in Arkansas. Because it used to be 70, now it's 55 on the regular highways. And, and 70 on the interstates. And so you're driving along uh, and, and you're doing 70 miles an hour on a two lane road and you think you're doing the speed limit and all of a sudden there's blue lights behind you. And there's a siren. And the cop pulls you over and you pull over and you, you roll down the window and he says, uh, where are you going in such a hurry? Are you going to a fire? Did somebody die? What's your hurry? Well, officer, I thought I was driving the speed limit. You're 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. Don't you know? If the speed limit's 55 miles an hour, well, officer, I didn't know. I thought I was driving the speed limit at 70. I didn't know it was 55. Now, here's a question for you. Will he let you off or will he give you a ticket? I don't think he'll let you off. He won't do it in Arkansas. I don't think he'll do it in Illinois either. I think you'll get a ticket. And I think I would too. Because you know what? They give books. When you take your driver's test, when you want to take your driver's test, they give you books to read, don't they? to find out what the driver's uh, the laws are in the state of Illinois. And you're supposed to know those to take a driver's test that shows you know the laws the, the, of driving in the state of Illinois. And you have the obligation to learn those laws. And you know what? God has given us a book that has all the rules in it, and it's not that hard to understand it. Here it is right there. And you have the obligation to study that book and learn what the rules are. No! Ignorance is no excuse under the law. Our obligation is to get busy and find out what the rules of the Lord are. And you know how many times he sinned? He just sinned one time. That's all he just sinned one little, just one little sin. By the way, let me see, think about something. How do, how do we know that trying to buy the, the ability to impart the Holy Spirit is a sin. How do we know that? 
There's only one passage in all the Bible that explicitly teaches that it's a sin to try to buy the power to impart the Holy Spirit. And that's this passage. Simon sinned one time in ignorance. And Peter said, you're in the gall of bitterness and you're in the bond of iniquity. I've had preachers, preachers of the gospel argue with me. I said, think about it, Keith. Well, here's an elder of the church. And he's been serving. They can really paint a picture here. He's been serving the Lord for 50 years. And he's always lived a good life. And he doesn't say bad things. And he treats people right. And he's gone into the store. And he bought himself a new suit. Nobody buys new suits anymore. This is an old illustration. He's gone into the store. He's bought himself a new suit. He's walking out the door wearing that brand new spanking suit. He, he spent his last dollar for that suit. And a car comes along and hits a mud puddle and splashes muddy water all over that new suit, ruins it. And in a fit of rage, well, there he should have learned to control his temper, shouldn't he? He, he utters an old ugly word, and that car jumps the curb and hits him and kills him, and he dies without repenting that ugly word. He's going to go to hell. Well, I'm not in the business of judging. That's up to the Lord. I'll tell you this. Simon sinned one time. He did it neither. He didn't know any better. And he was a babe in Christ. And Peter said, you're in the gall of bitterness and you're in the bond of iniquity. If you've sinned, you better not look for excuses. You better look for a right heart to repent of that sin and pray God for forgiveness. And that is one more excuse. And it doesn't work. In James chapter 2, verse 10, whoever should keep the whole law and yet sin in one point stumbled at one point, he is guilty of all. Now, from the point is not, you know, all right, uh, if you're tempted and you cheat somebody uh, in a business deal, uh, and, and that makes you an adulterer and a fornicator and a murderer, no, that's not the point. The point is, God's law all stands as one unitary whole. If you're tempted and you violate God's law in one point, you haven't just violated one law, you violated his law. You're a law violator. And that's what a sinner is, is a law violator. You've violated the law of God. And if you're tempted equal to another point, you'd sin there also. When you sin, you've sinned against God's law. And you must repent of that and ask God for forgiveness. One other point on this as far as his excuses that he had, he was humble about it. He wasn't proud. He was a very humble man. Uh, then Simon answered, pray the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. Now, you know, we say today, well, my mother would say that, that Peter read him the riot act. Or my mother from Texas would say that she told him how the cow ate the cabbage. I don't know exactly what that means, but that means you really tell him off. And P Peter told him off. He, he said, you're in the gall of bitterness, in the bond of iniquity. A lot of people get mad at that point, wouldn't they? But Simon did. He was humble. He said, pray the Lord for me that none of the things that you've spoken may come. And by the way, that's the right reaction. When we see it's good to get others to pray for us because we, we need all the help we can get. So I, every excuse I've ever heard in my life for God overlooking a sin, one, just one little sin on the part of a child of God, Simon had. But you know what Simon had to do? There was a remedy for that sin. There's a remedy for sin in the life of, now it's not the same thing as, as the sin in the life of an alien sinner. That's different. But for a child of God, you see, we have access by prayer to the throne of God from Jesus Christ, our high priest. The alien sinner doesn't have that. They have to be baptized in Christ. But if you're a child of God and you've sinned, just one little sin, you've sinned, then you need to, to take advantage of that access that you have to the mercy seat of God through Jesus, our high priest. He told him what to do. Repent, therefore. Now, repentance doesn't just mean you're sorry. Repentance means you've changed your mind, and that leads to a change of life. Repentance is a change of will, a change of mind, that leads to a change of life. Repent, therefore, this your weakness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. If you are a child of God, and sin has stained your soul. I don't care what that sin is. I don't care what excuse you have. And that's true of Keith Sharp too, by the way. I don't care what excuse you have. 
God's not going to overlook that sin. You've got to meet His terms of pardon. You've got to do what He tells you to do. You've got to repent and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Now John says more about it. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which is, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now notice, He didn't say confess our sinfulness. When, when, when people pray, oh, I, I may have sinned in some way, please forgive me. First of all, that's not a confession of sin. That's a make, okay? And it's, now I, I, we're all sinners. No, 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 that's not a confession of sin. If you've sinned, confess what you've done. Be humble enough, just as Simon was, to admit what you've done. That's what confession is, to say with. You've been accused of sin, and you've been, yes, I, I did that. I'm wrong. Please forgive me. Confess, repent, turn away from that. Make up your mind, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to do it, live a different kind of a life from this point on. And, and repent of that sin and confess, Lord, I, I sinned in this way. I, I'm getting, not, I may have sinned, not if I've sinned. I've sinned. Confess the fact you've sinned and confess what your sin is. And then ask God for forgiveness. Pray God, perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. And it's good. And, and, as Simon asked Peter, to pray for him. He did the right thing. It's good to get our brothers and sisters to pray for us so that we can be forgiven of the sin. That's particularly true if they know of those sins because that affects our fellowship with one another. But nonetheless, it's good to get our brothers and sisters to pray for us. In James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another who may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Yes, just one little sin is all that it takes to stand between you and God. One little sin in the life of an otherwise faithful child of God will cause us to be lost if we don't repent, confess, and ask God for forgiveness. As Peter said to Simon, I see that you're poisoned by bitterness in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. If sin, if sin stains your soul, my brother and my sister, apply the remedy. Repent of that sin. Turn away from it. Say, I'll never do it again. Make up your mind not to do that. Confess that sin to God in prayer. Ask God for forgiveness for Jesus Christ, our high priest. And get others to pray for you. And particularly the sin is known because then it affects your fellowship with the brethren. Ask them to pray with you and for you. If you need to make your life right, we invite you to come all together.